So we're gonna do weaponizing rhetoric. Um, the reason why I think this is a really important workshop, particularly at the advanced level, is because it really allows you to take your speaking to the next level for two reasons. First of all, it's because I think that the difference between what an 80 and an 82 or an 84 looks like in many cases is defined by how well you sound or how well you're able to capture the room, capture the emotions of the argument, capture language, and not in a way that I think is determinative by your language proficiency, but rather in how you use certain adjectives, like do you say bad or do you say horrific? Uh, do you use an introduction that is useful in furthering your case rather than just like quoting Nelson Mandela or whatever for no reason? Um, the second reason is because I think that when we talk about style, we usually just mean things like, do you sound really angry during debates or is your style more like calm and collected and explaining? Um, or do you slow down a little bit or do you talk really fast? And although those things are related to style, I think that the real reason why you want to weaponize rhetoric is because it allows you to make your content better. So I'm, we're not going to talk necessarily about how to sound better just for the sake of sounding better and more understandable, but rather as ways to actively use rhetoric as a way to further your own content. Um, so I do think that rhetoric can be quite useful, but I think that it is quite useful because it allows your content to get to the next level. So that's why I think that is quite a sort of useful thing um, to have in debates. So I wanna first talk about narratives and how it allows you to further it, and then we're gonna talk about some other things as well. Um, I think that one of the best ways to have a winning case is to have a clear narrative about what your team stands for and what your argument is. Like, what is the thing that your team is defending? And not just that, but also giving a sense of importance to the thing that you're trying to push and do further. In debates, when, and especially in adjudication, when there's 15 minute discussions, it's very difficult sometimes for judges to watch a team that does everything kind of right and has four arguments and the arguments are all fine, but it's hard for them, for judges to be like, I think that this team has won against teams that have maybe just one or two arguments but that they just manage to make you feel like those arguments are really important, like a sense of pressure, a sense of importance to those arguments, a very clear story about the things that they are defending. I think that those are the teams that are better able to take bests and really high speaks in rooms, and I think that's what you want to do when you're weaponizing rhetoric. Yeah. So what you have to keep in mind is when judges are adjudicating debates, especially when there's a lot of arguments in the room, they're going to remember your arguments by buzzwords and by headlines. So that's, it's very important to make your headlines sound important. I think a very good example of this is for, in debates where we debate about the right to choice, for example, how you frame the right to choice. In a sense, the right to choice is obviously very important to you because it enables you a greater scope of agency to fulfill your interests, you get to be more happy because you can follow your own image of what you want to be in life and so on and so forth. But if you can frame it in a different way, if you can say, look, the only way in life in which I can be happy is to follow my own interests and my own agenda as to how I want to be happy. That means if I do not have the right to choose and somebody is choosing for me, I am denied the achievement of my picture of who I want to be in life. This means that if the dignity of my life is dependent on my ability to choose how I want to achieve happiness, then the question of a debate about the right to choice is a question of the right to a dignified life. Because without choice, you do not have the ability to choose for yourself. Therefore, your picture and who you become is somebody else's is the extension of somebody else's will, not yours. At this point, you are making an argument about the right to choice with an equal level of analysis, but the judge remembers your argument as being about the right to life, which intuitively sounds far more persuasive. And I think there's a real life example of this. If you take a look at the abortion debate, there's a reason why the left is very often called clumsy in these discussions. And that is if you take a look at the dichotomy. <clears throat> the dichotomy is pro-choice versus pro-life. Getting to name yourself as pro-life is a very useful move. Because then you get the dichotomy as, as being about these people who say they are pro-choice. They want you to be able to choose about somebody else's life. How do you believe it is legitimate 
that somebody else can take full agency over whether our life exists or not. We are pro-life. You cannot take away other people's life because of the fundamental value here. And when you're trying to present a clash to someone who doesn't know much about it, the first thing that they hear, if that is the headline, which people are going to perceive as intuitively good, intuitively something they want to support and they want to stand behind, they're far more likely to listen to you. And know that even the best judges in the world have certain internalized biases. Their concentration drops, especially in later rounds and higher rounds. If you give them something that they're more likely to catch on to emotionally, they're more likely to listen to it. And that one sentence, which might be that one rebuttal, which lands to a second instead of a third, is going to be noticed by the judges. Especially important when you're ESL speakers, and you cannot rely on like the mess of language in that sort of sense. So that's my input on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> um, so I think also that Kim touches on an important thing. I do think that rhetorics has for too long been used by EPL speakers to sort of be like, oh, this is more better debating. So I think that utilizing like the tools of the master to bring them down is quite useful, and it's really useful to stop things like EPL extensions and stuff like that. So Tin actually touches on one of what I think are the four most important ways in which you can weaponize rhetoric. So one of them is, as he said, not just making the argument, but making the argument using moral intuitions and important moral values that we in society are familiar with. So don't just say like, we improve the quality of life of people. Be like, this affects individuals' right to choice, right to happiness, things that we intuitively already attach a very powerful value to. So I think that playing into those moral intuitions that people already have is quite a clever way to frame it. I think Tim explained it really well. So I think that's one of the ways that you can use to weaponize your rhetoric and to make, un like it's the same argument, right? But you're just making it more powerful. Um, I think there's other three ways in which you can do that. I think that one is using introductions and conclusions, and I think that these are oftentimes very undervalued in debates. I think that very often, and it's become more common now, that people will just like run content from the first second. So they will immediately be like three points into their speech really quickly, immediately jump into arguments. And I think that that's fine, but that just makes you the kind of team that I described earlier. It makes you the team that kind of runs arguments and runs them reasonably well, but there's no sense of importance for where your case is going. I think that introductions need to be really, really strategic. Introductions are the best way to immediately give judges a, this is what I'm standing for, because that's the thing that they're going to remember you by, by the best words that you say. So I think that the way that you need to utilize introductions is again, not by random quotes or by some, saying something that vaguely sounds pretty. It needs to be a, a picture of what your case is and why your case is important. So I think that a useful way to think about it is like, given that I am running an argument about the importance of choice, how do I explain that in a sentence, what it is and why it matters? And try to make it sound like important, precisely using those moral intuitions. Um, so for example, yeah, so for example, I'm gonna just give you guys an example and ask you to come up really quickly with arguments that you would run in, the, in a debate and then how you would use an introduction to really quickly, not analysis on the arguments, no more than 30 seconds, just explain to me what your case is and give me a sense of importance to it. Um, so, uh, uh, like, I really... Mm, this house believes that... Um, yeah, so a very common one. So, uh, this house believes that we should give, instead of welfare, a universal basic income to people in poverty. So, let's say we are on government. We say that we should give them a universal basic income rather than welfare. Um, really quickly, like, think of arguments that you might say in that debate. So, shout them at me. What would you say? Why, why should we give people a universal basic income? Oh, When you have a universal basic income, there is more freedom, but for the kind of thing, you probably not spend it more, not more, not, like not more poor people need the same services in yeah. the same manner, in the same volume. So this is yeah. Like, you know your circumstances, so once you have your money, you're better able to do okay. things that help you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What else? Any other? Uh, other than some economic stuff, probably the, the at least frame it in a way that look just because. 
just because we today live in a world where you are defined by what, how you work doesn't mean that that should be the narrative that should exist. If someone is able to self-actualize without working, he should, be, he should not be denied the right to life without that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You should also be able to access those things. Um, okay, does anyone have anything else? I think that those two are pretty solid. All right, so given that you're open in government and those are your arguments, how would you, as prime minister, start your speech? So this is a platform because we have a principal point, basically, and a like, more of a practical point. And I always struggle with what should you prioritize when you start your speech, what should come first. And I think like I have now a lot of good introduction as well. Yeah. But I've usually gone more to like principal point, like or you know, like this. So fundamentally both of those are about choice, right? Yeah. That individuals, yeah. regardless of their circumstances, know their circumstances better than the government and they're better able to make their lives better and get out of poverty if you allow them the choice that rich people already have to get out of those circumstances and to <laughs> use the money in a way that is useful to them. So I think that's starting with that sort of very intuitive. As an individual, I know my own circumstances better than anyone in the government ever will. I know what I need to get out of poverty and therefore giving me welfare it is, is unhelpful to me achieving that goal. We think that by giving individuals their own money, you empower them to make decisions for themselves that will improve their lives. So I think that that allows you to really quickly, in like a sentence, say what you stand for, choice, the idea that individuals know their circumstances best, and that therefore they're the ones best placed to make those decisions. But immediately, judges already know what your case is all about. And in a discussion, I can immediately, as a judge, be like, I think OG won. I think that their principle of choice and that individuals know themselves is really good and really difficult to <coughs> come back against. But I think that using introductions in such a way is really, really generally very important to what making judges vote for you, but also to what creating a narrative that will permeate towards your case. So I think that this is like a useful way, in addition to the thing that we mentioned before about playing to people's moral intuition and moral principles. A lot of you already do this <clears throat> in a sense that you signpost your arguments at the beginning of your speech. This is my first argument, this is my second argument, this is my third argument. But the problem is, if you do it as a list, you, you're essentially wasting time because the judge is going to hear what your argument is. The judge needs to hear why it's important at the beginning of your speech. So it's not you cannot do this, you're already wasting time on this. The thing is, you can change the way you do this. So one way was to say what the CS said, the other was to say, first we're going to prove the principal point of why people should have choice, secondly we're going to prove this is practically more efficient because at this point people get to define how they're going to use their money. This is, argue, this is an argument that the judge can reasonably conclude that you're going to money. But from that there is no emotional response. There is no idea as to why this is important. I think the most legendary example that we always quote in memes is Bo Sela's final speech. And people quote his introduction in every single meme. But the point is not in the only in the way he frames his sentence. When he starts with the idea that the poor of the world live in a dictatorship called No Alternatives, that first sentence is already the framework. He's already telling you, what I'm going to prove is that regardless of all of these harms, regardless of what might come out of this, at the point when you don't have an alternative, and at the point where you are forced in that position, <clears throat> in his words, shackled, you are legitimate in reacting. And you're not wasting time here because he's already delivering content. He's already telling you, in his first sentence, A, there is no alternative. In his second, when he's talking about the shackling and stuff, he's telling you, these people are forced. If there's no alternative and you're forced by someone, you're legitimate to self-defend. His entire case is permeated by that principle. And then when you weigh it as a judge, you say, okay, they very clearly stated that their stance was, the condition of no alternatives is what makes this legitimate. Therefore, opposition has to prove it's a critical alternative. He didn't just set a frame, he also set a burden. And he did it in a way that we were still quoting it. And I think that's what you can aspire towards. And I generally think watching good debates is a way for you guys to get a hang of what good intros are supposed to do. Yeah, I think that the, a, a, a useful way, or at least I always write down my introductions word for word. <coughs> I don't write any other part of my speech word for word, but introductions are a thing that gets you off to a good start. But also importantly, something that you do want to very carefully think about each word that you're saying. So I think attempting to get into the practice of thinking what is my case and what is the best way in which I can express what my case is, why my case matters in like a sentence or two, how can I best do that? And getting into the practice of doing it is really, really useful. Because as Tim said, 
if you just say the arguments, there's no emotional response and no real sense of importance, or why do I care about these 17 facts that you're giving me? Um, so I think that using introductions is a very useful way. I also think that conclusions in the same way, but conclusion is obviously like a bit more annoying because it's like, at the end of my speech, I'm running out of time. I don't have time to deliver my last 45 seconds of analysis. What do I do now? Um, I think it's really useful to have like a set conclusion that you just add an extra depending on the debate. I always, like you should always, so I'm very boring to watching conclusions. Um, but if I always conclude with at the end of the day, and then the way that I do it is we prefer to have X versus Y. So it's like, I would rather live in a world where the poor have a meaningful way to opt out of the systems of oppression that they live under, rather than a world where we claim to what is best for the poor, but realistically we're living them with no alternatives. So I'm still weaponizing my conclusion. I am still saying, this is why we stand for, and this is why we prefer it. We're willing to trade it off against what the opposition is going to say. So I think that also thinking about conclusions in the same way of like establish, of like using them to establish a trade-off or using them to in a sentence say why well, your case is the most important thing of the debate. Like the most important thing in the debate and the thing that judges you need to remember is whatever you think is the most memorable part of your speech. But I think that again, using those first seconds and those last seconds, which are the things that judges are going to remember your case most by is really, 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 really useful. Yeah. I think the way you can practice this in a similar way to which you practice PM speeches. So very often when we give people advice for PM speeches, it's okay, take a motion, prep a case, give a speech, record your speech, and then compare it to another speech somebody else gave on a recording. The same thing you can do with intros. And given it takes less time, you can take 10 motions, 15 motions, take 30 seconds to come up with general arguments, and make an introduction. Find a recording of that debate, and watch how these speakers made the introduction. And then try to analyze the introductions word for word. What did they deliver to their introduction? What did you deliver? Do you think that they were more clear than you in conveying what their frame is? Do you think they were more clear than you in conveying what their burdens are and the other team's burdens are? Even if it doesn't take that much time, you can literally substitute the 15 minutes of prep time you would have in practicing a PM speech. We're taking 15 minutes to literally analyze the two introductions and see what was different. It works in a similar fashion to POIs, right? When during the debate you try to prepare the perfect POI, you change punctuation marks, you add words, you remove words, you want to cram everything in those 15 seconds. I think the principle here is similar and the process of strategic thought is very similar. Um, so another thing that I think in addition to those two that we already talked about is um, the way that you achieve impact <coughs> to arguments. Uh, I think that it's very common and you probably have this told this before that you never want to make an argument and give like a personal example because then it's like, yeah, but that happened to you or to your sister. It doesn't apply to everyone. Um, I think that's true, but I only think that it's true insofar as you don't want to give an argument that literally only applies to a certain group of people, but I do think that given a human aspect to your impacts is really useful. So when you're talking about like, like for example, in the previous, um, workshop and also with the intermediates, we were chatting about how, for example, on feminism rounds, oftentimes you have things that are good for women who are housewives, but bad for women who don't want to have children at all. And I think that in those cases, it's quite useful actually to bring a human element because it helps judges visualize what your impact of helping women who don't have options looks like. And I think that using that, you need to do two things. So firstly is tell the story. So be like, for women, well, like whatever the argument is, for women who don't want to be pres to do to do the things that the patriarchy prescribes them to do, who don't want to be housewives, who want to go to university, who don't want to have children or get married, for those women, it becomes incredibly difficult to ever get the things that they want when the feminist movement is not protecting them, but rather supporting the other side. I think that there you draw a story, right? And you're explaining what happens to an individual and how it makes their life worse rather than just saying in very general terms that it does. And if you do that, I do think that after that you do need to go like, and this applies to women everywhere, or this applies to women who want anything that goes against the patriarchy. But you're explaining the human impact and then giving an analogy, like explaining how that human impact doesn't just apply to that person, but applies to everyone. 
like, I don't know, like in the beta of representation, like having um, gay characters in Disney movies or having gay characters be like very prominent in media. It's like imagine as a child growing up the incredible difference that seeing someone who looks like you, who feels like you, who likes the same gender that you do can have in a world where everyone tells you that what you like is wrong and where you never see anyone who looks like you or who behaves like you and therefore you feel different. And that happens to every single child who grows up in more conservative societies where there's no gay individuals around them to tell them that their existence is valid. So there I am doing this sort of like individual story, here is what happens to a human person, and then I am doing that this applies to everyone. And I think that that can be quite useful in debates where sometimes it's like kind of difficult to conceptualize a human impact. So explaining the human impact and then after explaining how it gets better helps judges visualize your impact and helps them feel like your argument is important and matters in some way. Yeah. Apart from what Lucia is saying about constructing a story, I think there's two other ways in which you can emphasize this. One is where you kind of imply that your personal experience makes you more authoritative and knowledgeable on the topic. This is not to say, oh, I went to political science and I studied that so I know I are, but that's to say, for example, if you're debating about interventions in a certain country, you can start an argument by saying, look, here in the Balkans, we understand interventions. We understand reasons why they often fail. These are these reasons. Then immediately, you sound a little bit more funny. The judge is more inclined to listen to you because there is a veneer of objectivity when you say, I experienced this, I know how this went through. And it's far easier for you to push arguments from your own personal context. So, these reasons I gave to you, look, it's exactly what happened when they belonged to Yugoslavia in 1999. And then, and then your example also becomes more credible at that point because you seem to be speaking from a point of personal perspective. It is, it is not an appeal to, to like authority because you're still making a general argument. However, you are constructing an image of yourself in which the reasons you are presenting are more credible because you seem to have gone through them yourself personally. And the second thing is, and I think this applies more to like squishy arguments, is appealing to common human emotionality. So when you're trying to make an argument about how someone will feel, for example, in the final Budapest Open this year, it was about regretting the norm that, that forgiveness is a virtue. And we were running an argument about how it's very important to be able to be angry at someone and to use this anger as motivation, to use this anger as a closure mechanism. And it's very hard to weigh that because how do you quantify you feeling angry and this being a good feeling in any sort of way? And what we said was, look, man, we know this sounds squishy, but we also know you experienced this. We know that all of you have had things that you regret in life. We all know you've had relations that are hard to deal with. And we all know that sometimes it was very useful for you to be able to say, let the person fuck off, I'm going to show them they were wrong. And that this was the way in which you like, <clears throat> repulsed those negative thoughts, in which you rejected them and threw them out of your head. And at that point, the judge is probably going to go, oh yeah, I did this. Because most people didn't do this. And, at, and when you can connect to your everyday life, you realize that although it's hard to quantify debaters, it means something to you every day because it's something you use every day. And you start according to significance. So appeal to common emotionality. You can literally say, look, panel, we know you experienced this. We know this happened to you. And if you did it, you're probably very lucky people. And then there's that, that element of kind of shame for privilege, which is also very useful in the face. Yeah, I think, like, I, I, I totally agree with all of that. I think that also, particularly the debate that you mentioned about the stuff, the sort of utilizing your own identity in the debate can sometimes be very useful. I think that it's also useful because it means that in the next time comes after you, then tries to explain to you what Yugoslavia is actually like, they sound terrible. <laughs> and panels are just like, I don't know, like whenever I get a war on drugs today, I'm just like, look, as a Mexican, let me talk to you about the war on drugs. And then like whoever tries to respond is just in quite an awkward position because then the panel is like, I guess she must know what she's talking about, right? I also have a very hard time debating Tim on anything about interventions precisely because of that, right? Because I haven't had one in like 200 years. So, um, and I think that you can use that for literally anything. And it doesn't just have to be something that is like unique to your country, but rather you can use that with like any particular policy. You can be like, this has happened in countries in the Balkans, or like as a woman, or like as a person who doesn't speak English as a first language, I think it's a pretty useful one to draw on. As like, here's how works with it, blah, 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 blah. That is also quite difficult to come back to. Um, yeah, but all of these, I think, have in common this sort of, you need to break it down to a human level and do something that people in the panel and individuals who are listening to you will relate to. Um, so I think that those are quite useful for that. Um, what other ones did we have that we wanted to talk about? <coughs> well, what I specifically found useful, because it was something that Lauren and I did quite a lot, is 
pointing out bias in language. Because, at least from my personal perspective, one of the greatest problems in contemporary debating is the fact that there is a huge ESL bias, especially if you have an accent, especially if you, su if you sound less confident because you're stuttering because you can't find the word. Judges, especially mid-tier judges and lower-tier judges, are less likely to like, give you importance, are less likely to consider you because they think that you know less because of the ways. I think it's very useful to point out the fact that you are ESL and still making good analysis. So, we did this all the time with words, saying things like, I know the repeal and they sound better, but our case is the only one that's true. In the same, in the semifinals in front of an audience, which is mostly Iona and a panel which is like Iona plus Israel, saying things like, look, we know the repeal and they sound better, but we know the economics, make judges consider your case twice. Because they feel bad about maybe listening to a team more because of EPL, because nobody does this on purpose. Nobody says, I hate ESL people, I want all the EPL people to go through Britannia Road waves, nobody does this on purpose. But, but they do it subconsciously, and then when you call them out on it, they ask themselves a question, fuck, am I doing this subconsciously? Am I giving teams worse speakers simply because they, they sound in a different way, because they have different accent? So I think calling out that kind of privilege is perfectly fine. And like also jokes on that. I mean, when Stefan Serejanski in, in his uh, UTC final said, oh, I'm moving on to the more ESL part of my case backlash, and then everybody laughed. I mean, this is something that's captivating to the audience and captivating to the judges and will give you more attention as a team, especially like in panels which don't have a lot of time for deliberation and things tend to get overlooked and similar stuff. I think pulling it out, like whenever you can't hear people, I think in bias debates, I think the most common thing that I mentioned is like the fact, like there's some, sub there's some subconscious biases that you just can't get rid of. Like the fact that I have a funny accent means that you listen to me less and you will likely think my EPL partner is less, is, is more persuasive in this argument. And that way immediately judges are like, maybe. Um, so weaponize it every time that you can. Um, I think it's particularly useful. In the other thing that I think is also quite good is to change the words, certain words that you use to impact arguments or to analyze arguments. I think that it is quite different to say that something is bad than to say that something is horrific or to say that something is terrible. So trying to change the words that you use, and like it's still just a word in a sentence, but I think that makes a quite a different impact. Um, and I think that getting used to, or like the, at least the way that I did it, because I used it to be like, this is bad because all the time. And I think that just changing that to different words can, like, quite literally after you speak, because I found, I found that it did. Um, I think that you just need to get used to using certain words more. I say horrific all the time, and I constantly say outrage as well. Um, but those are just, like, my go-to words that I constantly use in speeches to impact my arguments and to sound that my arguments are more than they actually are. And obviously don't be, like, don't go super crazy on it. If it's, like, a low-impact motion about the effect that the effect that like an individual book is going to have on the economy or something like that obviously don't go like this is going to destroy economies and ravage nations but i think that you can use those words in many other ir motions right or in many other economics motions that you would likely encounter so i think that just changing the like this is going to be bad for the economy to this is going to destroy economies and um, can quite literally change the way that your impact is perceived Particularly when judges are just weighing off sort of like two impacts that seem kind of bad, they're likely to put more weight on to the one that has words that make it sound terrible. So just be very aware when you're impacting as well to deliberately change certain words. Um, again, there's few parts of my speeches that I like actually write very much word for wordy, and in impacts I usually do have sort of like in big letters the big <coughs> words that I want to hit in that impact when I'm giving it. Um, so that's sort of useful. Uh, I don't have any other sort of tip in regards to rhetoric that I would like to give. Yeah, I'm running out of time anyway. Yeah. Do you so, guys have any questions? Do you guys have any questions or anything? Okay, cool. Well, I hope this was useful. Hope this was useful. I hope to see you do rhetoric next time we see you. <laughs>